the presenter is going to be me. I hope that's okay. I hope, uh, I hope you're all right with that. <laughs> it's not about time. Um, it's about the fourth dimension. Uh, <laughs> uh, so this talk, um, this is called Glimpsing Indirectly at the Fourth Dimension. Um, who is this, by the way? Dali, Salvador Dali, that's right. Okay, what does Salvador Dali have to do with the fourth dimension? I don't know, guys, but I think we're going to learn something today. Look at his eyes. <laughs> yeah, his, <laughs> good. his eyes are the fourth dimension. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, guys, so uh, what is this? Anybody know? Ooh, yeah, Plato's Cave. So this is Plato's Cave. So the story of Plato's Cave, I'm going to truncate it pretty exceptionally. But, um, so... Your whole life, you're chained onto this wall, and you're staring at these images, um, and on the wall, you see these 2D images, and these 2D images are cast by this fire, casting a shadow on the 3D image. But all that you ever see are these 2D images. As these 3D objects rotate, the 2D shadows on the wall, they morph. And it looks as though the object itself is changing, even though it's not. So you get this very distorted image of what the world looks like, because all that you ever see is the world in the second dimension. You've never seen the three-dimensional world. Everybody with me so far? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Okay, well, one day, you escape. You break off your chains and you climb up and you go out and you go out and you look above and you see this 3D world. You see all of life in all of its dimensions, well, all of its three dimensions anyway. And you go back down, you go back down and you try to tell your friends and you say, guys, there's so much more to the world than just what we're looking at. I understand now why everything looks so strange on this wall. We're only seeing a part of the story, but come on with me, come see the three-dimensional world, it'll make so much sense. And your friends, they say to you, if you break me out of these chains, I will kill you. So that's the story of Plato's Cave. <laughs> okay. Um, so one of my favorite lines from Buddhism, uh, it's attributed to the Buddha Siddhartha Gautama, whether or not he was a real person doesn't matter. It's attributed to him, um, and it's don't mistake the finger for the moon. That is to say, if someone is pointing at the moon, don't look at my finger, stop looking at my finger, look at the moon, look at the thing that I'm pointing at. And here the Buddha is saying, don't look at my words. My words don't mean anything. Look at what I'm pointing at that's beyond what my words can possibly express. Um, in occultism, there's a similar line that's often thrown around, which is the map is not the territory. If you're exploring a new world, don't get stuck on the map. Look out, look out, look out. Stop looking at the map. So I'd like to talk some about maps. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a Mercator map. Um, now, what is this a Mercator map of? The Earth. The Earth, yeah, very good, very good. Okay, now we're, we're, probably, we're probably all aware of the controversy that's been surrounding the Mercator map really since the 90s, though it seems to resurface once every couple of years, namely about the relative sizes of Africa, the continent of Africa, to the size of the United States of America, to the size of Greenland, right? So there's a problem. When we try to take a 3D object and project it onto a 2D surface, there are all of these distortions that happen because it's just impossible to, to appropriately project a 3D object onto a 2D surface. Africa becomes so much smaller because it's near the equator. The United States becomes larger. Greenland becomes so much larger, right? Okay, so you probably know that throughout time there have been a few different um, proposed solutions to this. So a few different maps here, um, some that serve different purposes. This one, the relative sizes of Greenland, the United States, and Africa are actually maintained, but if you try to draw a line directly from, say, New York City across to London, the latitudinal lines won't match up. Right, so every one of these maps, they have their own set of positive characteristics <laughs> and their own set of negative characteristics. But each one is a distortion of the true three-dimensional object. Okay, everybody with me so far? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. 
What is this? <laughs> Rectangle. <laughs> Anybody else? It's a cube. Yeah, very good. Okay. So this is not a this is a picture of a cube, right? So this is a this is a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional object. This is a two-dimensional representation of a cube of a three-dimensional cube, right? So we have these three dimensions: height, width, and depth, okay? That are being represented here. Okay. Now, Scientists, uh, mathematicians, recognized that it's impossible for us to know what the fourth dimension looks like. We're just not hardwired to possibly know. But in the same way that we can represent a three-dimensional cube on a two-dimensional surface, maybe it's possible to represent the fourth dimension on a three-dimensional surface. Right? So that's what I'm going to take you through the process of now. Okay, first, we need to look at the way that mathematicians have attempted to project the third dimension onto a two-dimensional surface. So if we imagine a light source up at the top here, casting a light down into the semi-translucent cube, it produces a shadow that looks like this. Now again, there are these distortions. The top of the box is the same size as the bottom of the box, but because the light is shining at different distances, it appears as though this square is larger than this square that's inside. Of course, it's not actually larger. It's just because of the relative distances from the light source. Does that make sense? Cool. Now, if we were to rotate the cube and zoom down underneath, looking at the projection, it again, even on this 2D surface, appears as though it's a 3D object in rotation. And as we watch it, if you notice, I can't slow it down now, but if you notice the lengths of the sides of the cube, they appear to get larger and smaller and larger and smaller and larger and smaller as they rotate <laughs> around its center. Yeah, everybody sees that. Larger and smaller and larger and smaller. Great. Okay. Does anyone know what this is? Yes. Okay, so this is called a tesseract. So um, what we're going to talk about now are two ways that mathematicians have attempted to um, allow us to glimpse indirectly at the fourth dimension by looking at representations of the fourth dimension in the third. So this is considered to be the three-dimensional shadow of a four-dimensional cube. I'm going to break this one down a little bit. If we were to cast a light um, we, we can't see a four-dimensional object. We can't see it. But if we were to cast a light onto a four-dimensional object, creating a three-dimensional shadow, this is what mathematicians say that that three-dimensional shadow might look like. Okay? Let me break this one down a little bit. We have zero dimensions <laughs> at a single point. Everybody's got that so far, oh, yeah, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So... A single point is zero dimensions. And then if we move to a line, we have one dimension. If we take that line and stretch it into a square, we then get two dimensions. If we take that square and we stretch that into a cube, we get three dimensions. If we then stretch that cube, we can get four. Let me show you here. So here's zero dimensions at a dot. As the dot expands, we move into the first dimension. The line expands into a square, creating the second dimension. The square expands into the third dimension, creating a cube. Now the cube expands into the fourth dimension, creating a tesseract. Okay. Now, this is a tesseract. Just from that one animation, it's a little hard to wrap your minds around. Do you remember in the first video of the three-dimensional cube rotating, it appeared as though the lines were getting larger and smaller, even though they were actually staying the same size. Well, if we were to rotate a four-dimensional cube and look at the shadow of the four-dimensional cube as it rotates, we're looking at the rotation of a three-dimensional cube, we're looking at the rotation of the shadow of a four-dimensional cube in the third dimension. It would look like this. So again, it appears as though pieces of the object are getting larger and smaller. But this is only because the same sized sides 
are rotating in the fourth dimension. Okay. Now, I told you there were two ways that we're going to attempt to project the fourth dimension into this third dimension. First, I need to show you another way that we project the third dimension into the second. The first one is creating a shadow with a light source. The second is by using what's called the net. You can unfold a box. If you imagine a cardboard box and you unfold its six sides, you get something that looks like this. You get something that looks like this kind of sideways cross. So each one of these squares, each one of these individual squares, if you were to repurpose them, if you were to repiece them back together, would then create a cube. Now, if we were to again, <laughs> oh no, if we, <laughs> if, <laughs> if we were to again take a light source above this unfolded three-dimensional cube and fold it back up again with the shadow being cost, cast on a two-dimensional object, it would look like this. Now, you see, once again, it looks as though a piece of the object is getting larger and smaller, but it's not. It's maintaining its size. Only because we're reducing the dimensions does it appear to get larger and smaller. Can everybody get this so far? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> okay. So, then, what mathematicians attempted to do they said, this is what it looks like when we unfold a third dimensional object into the second dimension. Now the question is, what would it look like if we were to unfold a four dimensional object into the third dimension? Of course, we can't see a four, a four dimensional object, but maybe we can see an unfolded four dimensional object in the third dimension. And this is called a hypercube. <laughs> so, so what we did, if you imagine the very, in the center, I mean, not, not quite the center, right, but the center of these cubes here. In the middle here, there's one cube, and that's kind of the original. When you take a line, you stretch out the line, bringing it into another dimension. You stretch out all of the, 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 you stretch out the sides of the line, bringing it into the next dimension. You then take that square, you stretch it out, taking it into the third dimension. Here what we're doing, we're taking that cube, we're unfolding each piece of the cube in the same way that the box unfolds into six separate uh, squares. The hypercube, or the four-dimensional tesseract, the four-dimensional cube, would unfold into these individual cubes. <laughs> okay, now, let's watch this in action. And what I want you to pay attention to is, oh, no, I'm just gonna let you watch it. I'm just gonna let you watch it. Okay, so here we have a tesseract. And what I'm about to show you is a four-dimensional object unfolding into the third dimension. <laughs> Just pay attention to this bottom cube wrapping back up. <laughs> now, um, 
with all of this, this has really been a very long introduction to let you know about my favorite painting that's ever been made. And this is Dali's Corpus Hypercubus. So Dali never wrote specifically what he meant by this piece. But I think that what he was trying to say is that God, if we were to put a label on it, if he were to put a label on it, or if I were, it's certainly something that's well beyond the limitations of our brain. We just can't see it. It doesn't matter how hard we try, what logic we use. It doesn't matter what visual representations. We can't see it in the same way that we just can't see the fourth dimension. But maybe we can glimpse at it. Maybe we can't see the fourth dimension, but we can see its shadow. Maybe we can't see God, but we can see its shadow. And maybe he's saying that the character of Jesus should not be looked at, or this is not just Christian, this is any, any mythological or religious figure, any mythological or religious figure should not be seen as the God itself, but instead looked at something that is indirectly pointing at the truth. Don't mistake the finger for the moon. Jesus, or any mythological figure, is just a 3D shadow of a God that is so far beyond our comprehension. Thank you very much. <laughs>